Okay, I've turned the recording on, and uh, now we're right at 7 o'clock. Maybe I could get everyone, if you would, to type in your state and county. So David's from Cape Cod. I'm assuming that's in Massachusetts. I'm in Schuyler County tonight, working from the Cornell University Arnott Forest. What this does, it allows me to see the you know, kind of the not kind of, but the geographic distribution of people. Um, hi, Ian. Hope all's well in St. Lawrence County. Um, see the geographic distribution of people, but also gives you a chance to make sure that you're familiar with the chat pod. So the place that you're typing in this information is how you will ask me questions if you have questions as we go through the, go through the uh, webinar. And please, as we're going along, feel free to um, uh, uh, to ask questions or offer comments. I was this is uh, uh, the, the presentation's pretty dense, and I'll try to keep track of keep one eye on the chat pod and one eye on the presentation, so I don't lose track of what I'm saying. Um, if I do, uh, I'll I will scroll back at the end and make sure I cover all of those. And Graham's putting in a plug for a workshop. Anybody that's within striking distance of the Tug Hill area of New York, which is uh, just a bit north of Syracuse, there's a workshop Tuesday evening, so next week at 5.30. Um, and I think, uh, Graham, the, that workshop was actually listed by Christy Sullivan on the events calendar at the Ning site. So for those of you that have just joined in, that Ning site is a new uh, interface that we have. You can see the link in the upper right hand corner. Go ahead and click on it um, and you can go back to it and check it out later. Similarly, this is a kind of a last call for anyone who wants continuing education credits. Click the link in chat pod number three. So as I do that, let's jump over to the presentation. And we'll get started. I'm Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I'm also the host of uh, the Forest Connect program and the, um, and the coordinator of this webinar series. So I'm glad that you're, you're all here and I'm looking forward to a great presentation. So there are uh, some foresters who are participating tonight and to, to ease your, any tensions you might have, this as a uh, the title of this, um, an introduction to silviculture and strategy, silvicultural strategies for private woodlands is, is obviously a very long cry and a long shot away from the formal silvicultural training that a forester receives in forestry school. And that typically is a semester long course with dozens of lectures and dozens of field labs. And so what, what I'm hoping to accomplish here tonight is to uh, share with uh, woodland owners a sense of vocabulary so that they can communicate better with their forester to provide some visual illustrations of tools and practices that might be used to talk about some of those tools when they might be more or less useful, although that's not a big part of the conversation, but we can make it part of the conversation if there are people who, if you ask questions, then we'll, we'll I'll be happy to respond to those questions. And then ultimately through this increased familiarity with, with, with the, the practice of silviculture is an increased application of silviculture. So let's jump right in and, and as I said before, if there are any questions that, that folks have as, as we're going along, please feel free to um, type those in the chat pod and I'll do my best to uh, respond to those. So we'll talk about what silviculture is. There's, it's actually, I, I didn't realize it was as long-winded as it is, but we take a long time to work up to the formal definition of silviculture. There's three or four slides that move us in that direction, but I think it builds a foundation for why the definition is what it is. We'll talk about applications of silviculture on private property. And this talk is very much geared towards silviculture in the 20 to 200 acre, let's say, category. And those are kind of loose boundaries, but it's to differentiate it from a, an industrial ownership that has uh, you know, 2,000 or 10,000 acres. 
Um, we'll, we'll give some examples of silvicultural practices and we'll, we'll conclude by talking about what um, silviculture is not. Hang on just a second. Okay, Christina was having some sound problems. Let's do a bit of jargon first. Um, we're going to, I'll talk about stands and silvicultural practices are applied within a stand, uh, typically not across stands. That's because stand is synonymous with a management unit or uh, in an agricultural sense with fields. So a farmer would have a corn field or a soybean field or a hay field and the, the principles of what defines a field are consistent with the principles of what defines a stand. So you have a, a relatively homogeneous, though not necessarily a monoculture, but a homogeneous uh, vegetative complement, homogeneous in terms of the mixture of species, the ages of the plants that are dominant, and the sizes, more or less sizes of the plant. Uh, and, and this is important because the actions that you take for example, in a corn field are very different than the actions that you might take in a soybean field or in a hay field. So uh, for, sim for efficiency and accuracy and simplicity of management, having these homogeneously defined more or less, I mean, you've been in the woods, you know that the forest is not typically homogeneous, but in the more or less homogeneous areas, um, you're going to do things uh, more or less the same. A, a parallel would be a flower garden versus a vegetable garden. And I've shown a picture on the right of um, a woodlot that my wife and I own. We own two woodlots and I'll show some pictures from these uh, tonight. But I have in this woodlot there are five stands, A, B, C, D, and E. Stand E, for example, in the northwest corner is a sugar maple dominated stand. It's a, a large diameter um, trees and what we do in stand E uh, management wise is different than what we do in stand C which is a smaller average diameter mixed hardwood, oak, hickory, and um, ash and beech stand for example. So the blue lines delineate stand boundaries and correspond fairly closely to soil types uh, and also disturbance history. Uh, yes, Scott points out seeing those topographic lines um, it's uh, it's steep in places. So another another jargon term that we'll probably use is the word stocking. Stocking refers to the number of quantity, number or quantity of stems per acre. So it might be the number of trees per acre, the volume of wood per acre, and it's relative to some maximum limit. So you have a maximum stocking. It's the maximum number of trees that you can squeeze onto an acre that's relevant because when you reach that upper limit, that maximum limit, the trees are at a maximum level of competition. So you may be having, you have a lot of trees per acre and the growth that's possible per acre is distributed among all those stems. Uh, there's also accelerated levels or increased levels of mortality amongst those stems because of that competition. So we'll use different silvicultural practices to control the stocking level uh, within a stand uh, typically to uh, reallocate uh, sunlight amongst the best trees so that they can grow more optimally. And I'll try to uh, define it some additional terms as we go along. Feel free though, uh, if, if I use a word and you don't understand it, please ask. We had some really good conversations about some of the word, word choices this afternoon. And I'll try and recreate those tonight. Okay, so what is silviculture? Uh, ultimately, silviculture is a means to an end, and some people, uh, for, some foresters included, will use silviculture as synonymous with timber harvesting because silviculture sounds like it's a good thing to do. Uh, silviculture sometimes involves timber harvesting, but silviculture is a process of manipulating the forest. It's a tool to manage the forest vegetation, and that may include things such as uh, as you see here in this upper left-hand corner, Jerry Michael is standing with some trees, 
planted in tree tubes. It may involve using herbicides selectively to control some individual beech stems. It may be managing for cavities in trees for cavity nesting birds. It may be managing for um, a complexity of structure. And structure, when I refer to structure, that's what the forest looks like. Here's a group selection cut in a uh, cherry forest in Genesee County, New York. Just excuse me a minute. Sorry about that. I have a bit of a cough and I'll need to turn my microphone on and off periodically. So silviculture is a, a desired, it helps us reach a desired endpoint. And what that desired endpoint is depends entirely on the owner's objectives. So let me give an example of that. Um, and, and I'm going to break this out by uh, what I'll refer to as direct or primary objectives. And this is just an example. Um, where, let, me, let me play this out. Um, so there may be direct objectives. And this would be, for example, what we have on our, my wife and I have on our property for um, primary objectives, timber, firewood, pulpwood, and maple sap. Um, and those are, are objectives that we directly um, manage for. We recognize, though, that by managing for these direct objectives that there will be indirect impacts uh, on other kinds of objectives that we have. So we have uh, wildlife habitat objectives, we have healthy tree objectives, we have recreational trail objectives, um, and we're not, uh, there, there's, we don't, you know, people say, well, aren't you going to manage for wildlife habitat? And I say, well, I am, but not directly. I'm doing it through, through uh, managing for timber and firewood. But I'm conscious of how that plays out for wildlife. Now, someone could very appropriately invert those two. And you might have your primary objectives be wildlife habitat and healthy trees and recreational trails. And as a result, you're going to have um, activity that relates to timber and firewood and maple sap, for example. And any two people could look at these two pictures from either a whatever your uh, primary or secondary objectives might be and, and describe them in very different terms. Uh, so we see something on the ground and we think about it in the context of what we all bring to this discussion tonight. So any, everybody here has kind of a different, not kind of, does have a different view on the world, view on uh, what they're trying to accomplish. And so they think about these, these um, uh, images in a different way. So silviculture is going to move us towards that desired endpoint. We define that endpoint through our statement of ownership objectives. And it's the owner that needs to define that. And then the owner would work with a professional to help accomplish that. So the, the professional should do a lot of listening. Um, and the uh, owner should do a lot of talking. So that means the owner has to do a lot of thinking and decide what it is that um, drives them. Why do they keep paying taxes on their property? What's their favorite thing that they show visitors when they have a chance to take people for a walk in the woods? So there are four processes or characteristics that silviculture attempts to control, and these are these get to the uh, the ecological and the uh, biological characteristics or elements of the definition. The ownership objectives are the human element of the, of the definition of silviculture. So let's take a quick look at these. One is establishment. And in the, in the eastern US, particularly the northeastern US, a lot of the establishment is natural regeneration. That's what's depicted here. But silviculture would also be the concept, the framework that's used if you're, if you're artificially regenerating a stand. If you're taking an agricultural field and you're planting it into uh, some uh, desired mixture of woody species. Uh, if you're trying to you know, ex move more quickly through the, the grassland succession stages. So establishment, and it might not be tree species, it might be establishing other kinds of plant species. So we think about, in silviculture, we think about what are we going to establish. Here I'm showing pictures of typically what people think of as desirable species to establish. Our actions can also lead to the establishment of undesirable species, so we have to be careful. Another element that silviculture works towards is the composition or this mixture of species that are present. In the left-hand picture, you see a sugar bush. 
and the sugar bush, this particular sugar bush is almost exclusively sugar maple. So that has one composition. Uh, the species in the right hand corner I think is also a sugar bush. It's in a different part of, of the state. Uh, but it's a, it has a greater variety and a greater mixture of species. So um, aside from the sugar bush element, the, the silvicultural processes, uh, the decisions that are made during that silvicultural process will have an impact on the mixture of species. And then that should re be reflected, reflective of what the ownership objectives are. The growth um, of plants, particularly diameter growth, is another process that silviculture tries to control. Um, in my translation from PowerPoint to Adobe Connect, I had 10 little black lines that showed the growth rings. Uh, maybe you can see the growth rings. What it shows was in the last uh, 10 years, this tree grew two inches of radial increment. This is a sugar maple tree in a woodlot in Ithaca, near Ithaca, that had been managed over the years uh, through firewood cutting to grow high quality, um, high quality saw timber. And this particular tree ended up becoming infected with a, a virulent, virulent strain of a fusarium fungus and, and had to be cut. But up until that point, the tree was growing well. And so silviculture had accomplished an ownership objective for growth rates. And then finally, quality. And quality is a, uh, is, is think about quality as beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And, and the, the things that we identify as objectives are how we define our quality. And we may have quality rate related to acorn production because we're interested in regeneration, but the, uh, the quality may also be related to uh, the, um, the production of acorns for wildlife. And we may have a, a quality definition based on uh, cavity nesting birds. And so having some threshold for a number of, of snag trees per acre. Or it may be a recreational trail. Uh, and it may be, and typically is, commonly a, um, as a mixture of these uh, of tangible and non-tangible or productive and aesthetic types of objectives. And so silviculture has the task of, of trying to blend those to provide the best combination of them all. So what is silviculture? Here's the textbook definition. First, breaking down the word silvi, Latin for trees and culture. I'd have to look up the derivation of that word, but I always think of it as management. So it's the management of trees. The formal definition, at least from uh, one silvicultural textbook, is the art and science of controlling uh, or trying to control the establishment, composition, growth, and quality of forest stands to achieve the objectives of ownership. Um, and you know, so these ownership objectives, it's not, um, you know, so we want to control it and, and uh, it's relative to uh, uh, um, a concept of sustainability. So it's not a matter of silviculture is, is much more than just going out and cutting trees to generate revenue. That's an exploitive effort. Um, we don't really need any science to do that. Um, and we, th we and I need to think about this a little bit more. Some of you may have some thoughts. It seems to me that most, if not all, of the activities or treatments uh, things we do in a woodlot will have some desired or undesired effect on those four components that define silviculture, the establishment, composition, growth, and quality. So going out and marking the boundaries won't affect those uh, necessarily. But if we're out doing, you know, cutting firewood or pruning trees or whatever it might be, all of them can have some effect on um, some or all of these components. So it's uh, that's, I guess, the good news, uh, but it also places a burden on us to be conscious of what we're doing and conscious of um, uh, near term as well as as um, more remote uh, outcomes. So Bob wants to know the uh, mean annual increment of the tree. It was a 15-inch diameter tree in the last, uh, it had grown uh, four inches in diameter uh, in the last 10 years. So I'll let you calculate that. 
Okay, so let's look at um, what I'll refer to as the silvicultural steps, and uh, this is this is just to give you a sense of some of the thought process and, and sequencing of operations that a forester would use. And, and silviculture is something that's applied with a professional forester, um, and this is to help acquaint you with, with how they would approach this. So I don't, Bob, I don't have the, um, the growth rates from the center of the tree. I could probably go find the stump. Um, okay, so the first step is determining what you want. And this is something that the landowner needs to do um, before they at least get started with, before they start talking to a forester. Uh, they can finish thinking about it after they have a conversation with the forester. Um, but what they'll typically find is their ownership objectives will cluster not, not uniquely not exclusively within one of these kind of three categories, uh, and there's often overlap, but there will, people will tend to be more in the aesthetic legacy biodiversity camp, uh, maybe in the more traditional camp, or in the utilitarian camp. And there are other ways. This is based on um, social science research of forest owners, woodland owners in New York, and particularly, and also in the Northeast and, and nationally. And there will be different words that are used here but people will, uh, people will tend to gravitate towards one of these areas, but have interest in the other ones as well. So, um, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to be completely pigeonholed. And, and how you know what your objectives are is, uh, requires some, you know, just some reflection on your own part. Ask yourself questions. You know, what do you like about the property? Uh, why do you own the property? If you bought it, why did you bought it? If you inherited it or you bought it a long time ago, why do you still pay taxes on it? It's um, uh, it, it, when, when somebody comes for a visit, what's the first thing you go and show them? Or if you have a question, what are the, what's the nature of those questions when you're trying to resolve something on your property? That will help you define what those objectives are. And you need to define, everybody should define their own objectives for their property. Have a conversation with other people that are part of that ownership. Um, and this, you know, sometimes my wife and I don't always uh, share, uh, communicate my objectives as well as I should, um, and um, I tr I'll try to do better on that. But anyway, it's, you know, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it, and then you have to be able to articulate that to your, to your co-owners, to your children, to your parents, to your uh, siblings, if you own it jointly, uh, and certainly with your forester, because if you the, the objective defines your target, and what you're going to do is trying to move your forest from its current configuration towards its desired configuration. The second step is to determine what you have, and this is in terms of the quality and the quantity um, of what you want, of what you, of, which is which is related to what you have, and then identifying potential barriers to, to being able to accomplish what you want. So one of those things is, is to think about what mixture of species you want on the property. It may be, uh, and this is a picture, there are two trees flagged. One is a, a sugar maple and the other is a white ash. This is in an area where the owner was trying to develop into a sugar bush, and so he was uh, thinning around um, well-formed sugar maple trees to help those trees develop a bigger crown so that they have a higher sugar concentration. But determinations of a good species very much depend upon the ownership objectives. So we, we're always going to go back to, and you should always go back to, what are my objectives? The objectives define where you want to go. So thinking about the species that are present, and, um, and maybe in some areas you have um, one species as a, as a preferred species on your property. In another part of your property, you have a different set of species as a priority species. Thinking about how many uh, stems, uh, total number of stems, but also how many um, of a desired species of stems. So in the upper left-hand corner, this was a, um, a, a section of woods on the Cornell's Arnott Forest that was clear-cut in, I'm trying to remember when, uh, probably 15 years before this picture was taken. 
maybe a little bit more. And the intent was to regenerate uh, red oak. Uh, and there was, you can see that there's a regeneration of hardwoods and a pretty good regeneration of hardwoods in terms of the number of stems. Uh, the question, though, would be through an inventory process, do we have enough oak stems per acre to meet our ownership objectives? Uh, the center picture shows uh, you could imagine this forest uh, developing in a few decades into the forest in the center. And again, now we're wanting to make sure not only that we have enough trees of the desired species, but enough trees of desired stem quality to meet whatever our ownership objectives might be. Then the final picture illustrates um, some objectives that might be related to uh, some wildlife or some old growth forest structures. So we see a, a snag here. We see some coarse suspended coarse woody debris. We see some downed coarse woody debris. And through inventory procedures, you can go out and you can measure, or your forester can go out and measure uh, how many snags per acre do we have, what's the volume of coarse woody debris that we have. And you can use civil cultural um, prescriptions to, uh, to influence the abundance of those, um, those forest qualities. Um, okay, Renee asks, very good question. Where are the stumps from the clear cut? Do you clear them out and then plant trees or cut coal saplings that are there? So this was um, I don't know, those. that was probably long enough ago, and I don't remember, it was before I was affiliated with the Arnott Force, so I don't recall the harvest system that was used in that upper left-hand corner. Um, we, I'm sure that the stumps were not cleared, so it may be that the trees were fairly widely spaced, and depending upon how they were cut, if it was, it, I don't think it was a mechanized harvest, um, then then those may have been fairly low to the ground. Uh, final point here on the lower right-hand picture, uh, there are some people that are very interested in old growth forest structures, and structure again is what it, the forest looks like in terms of the diameters of the trees, uh, the numbers of the trees per acre. Um, and Paul Catanzaro from the University of Massachusetts a year or so ago did a webinar on through the Forest Connect series on using silviculture to um, encourage old growth forest structure. Now it's not, you know, silviculture will not make your trees get older faster, um, but silviculture will be used to create different um, structural patterns in terms of patch patchworks of trees, create dead standing snags um, and accelerate the growth rates of trees so that some of the trees that you want to be bigger faster will be bigger faster. Uh, to find that you go to the to the archive of Forest Connect webinars and just scroll backwards through the calendar. Okay, I gotta talk a little bit faster. We're gonna be here all night, which is okay for me, but some of you will want to move faster. Okay, quality. Um, uh, quality is, again, dependent upon beauty in the eye of the beholder. So anybody looking at these pictures, we have a sugar bush, we have a very large diameter white pine in the lower left-hand corner. We have a closed canopy uh, hardwood stand with some very tight um, forks in the trees. So people would look at these and, and depending upon their ownership objective, would refer to the quality of this as good or not so good forest, uh, and that's fine. Uh, but what again, it's important that we're understanding in order to um, characterize how much of something we have, it's going to be dependent upon what our objective is. And then to illustrate um, a few of the barriers that can impede our success irrespective of our ownership objectives, well not irrespective, but in many cases we see in the upper left hand corner a uh, picture of uh, representing interfering vegetation. This happens to be a beach dominated woodland uh, and it's representative of the host of species that can interfere with the establishment of other uh, perhaps more desired plant species. So, and there's a webinar that we've done in the past on beach management. So, 
I won't go more into that. There's also a fact sheet on beach management. But interfering vegetation is a potential barrier. The picture in the upper right hand corner is from the uh, Old Forge, Tug Hill region, uh, north, I guess it's, it's kind of Tug Hill region of New York, where uh, it was, it was a, a plot where we were doing a deer management, beach management research project and illustrating that inside the fence, I hope you can all see the fence, we have uh, forest regenerating where we have excluded deer and controlled the beach and outside where we have only controlled the beach uh, but not excluded deer, we have nothing coming back. So when you can see the browse line uh, in the behind the area, behind the fence, there's no understory there as well. So deer can be a major impediment to our success. And then the lower right hand picture is a picture from a section of the woods that we own in the eastern Adirondacks. It's a cliff. It's a really cool looking cliff. It's maybe a 150 foot drop from the top to the bottom. Um, but it's not an area that's very conducive to moving equipment or moving wood around. So this is along a stream and it's a set aside that we have that's just going to be um, forever set aside. We have no intentions to do anything other than just to look for cool stuff that might be living and growing amongst the cliffs. So that's indicative though of topographic barriers and also to remind me of soil limitations. There may be uh, potentially uh, very wet, poorly drained soils or droughty soils that might be a barrier to success. So these are things that you and your forester need to talk about. Okay, the ages and sizes of trees will influence the management that you, uh, management treatments that you apply. Uh, and, and with, um, when managing woods, it's, it's helpful to recognize uh, one of two basic age structures. So in even age forests, these are forests where all of the trees have essentially the same age. Uh, and there's a, a technical definition, as I recall, it's something like 20% of the rotation age. So if your rotation age is a 100-year cycle, then you can have trees that are within 20 years of each other. And it's showing this, the cycle of following a disturbance. In this case, this was a, a clear cut that was done. Um, and these are four different areas. I'm just illustrating four different uh, age structures of even age forest. Eventually you will develop a some kind of a forest community if you can control interfering vegetation and you can control deer. Uh, that hardwood forest will develop into a sap, go from a seedling sapling stand into a pole stand and eventually into a saw timber stand. So most of the forests in New York uh, in the Northeast uh, in the Midwest, which developed following agriculture, follow this sequence. And so even though, as you see in this lower left-hand corner, you may have trees of very different sizes, they are often even-aged forests. And so what you do, the things that you do in an even-aged forest are very different than what you would do in an uneven-aged forest. In an uneven-aged forest, you have um, typically three or more distinct age classes, and those age classes may be clustered, as you see in this um, group selection cut, and this is a park in Genesee County, where group selection cuts of, oh, I think they were a tenth of an acre to a quarter of an acre were installed to try and regenerate some black cherry, which tends to be intolerant of shade, so it needs more sunlight than you can accomplish through a single tree cutting uh, system. But you would have different patches of, of age class here. This is a one or two year old or three or four year old age class. You can see um, a, a slightly older age class here and then you can imagine that these trees might be still yet another older age class. Now this is all, this is actually just um, uh, an abandoned agricultural field that had grown in. It may have been 60 or 80 years old. So there's really just at this point two age classes. There's the new age class and then everything that makes up this older age class. So uneven age forest and even age forest. We need, you, you need to look at your forest, talk with your forester and understand whether you have even age or uneven age. 
and these uneven age and even age silvicultural systems, if you maintain those or you want to shift from an even age to an uneven age, has different characteristics. And those are those are characterized here. Uh, I don't, don't need to read them to you, but you can see that the scale of activity is going to vary. The frequency of activity is going to vary. The age and size class diversity is going to vary. Um, and the species diversity is going to vary between these two. And don't, you know, these are kind of some general patterns. Don't, um, you know, don't get too locked in on, you know, particularly on those year intervals, for example. And in some parts of the species, diversity would depend upon some of the other barriers uh, that might be present. And so the, the contrast between uh, diversity for even age versus an even age system might vary depending upon region of the country and other circumstances. Okay. What's the sequence? Step four is the sequence of manipulations, if there are going to be any manipulations. And uh, in some, some woodlots, there may be no need or no desire to do any kind of manipulations whatsoever. But if there is, what's that sequence? And that sequence uh, depends on um, the intent of the treatment. And the intent of the treatment is whether or not you're trying to influence the current forest or whether you're trying to influence create the next forest. And so foresters refer to uh, manipulations where you're working on the current woods as a intermediate treatment. Uh, that's analogous to gardening. You can see the date on this picture looks like it's, I can't tell if it's July or August, but the effort in a garden in July and August is to pull weeds. You're not typically out there, you're not collecting much in the way of produce. You might be getting a few um, beet greens and some spinach and some Swiss chard, but your, you know, your pumpkin production hasn't come on. Your squash, some of your summer squash maybe has, but your, your winter squash hasn't come on. Uh, you might be getting a few beans, maybe a few peas, but the real production hasn't happened yet. Your efforts, your investment is really just because you know that there's going to be a bigger payoff at the end. So it's essentially it's weeding. And I've posted a link uh, just now in that uh, in the chat pod to a stewardship manual uh, that we have on the Forest Connect website. And you can look in that table of contents. There's an article in there about uh, forest management as gardening. And, and I, in that article, I tried to show the parallels between uh, gardening practices and forest management practices. I think it's a nice way to illustrate, um, as per ownership objectives, um, something that people tend to be familiar with, um, which is gardening, and, and, and show the correspondence to something that people tend to be less familiar with, which is forest management. So intermediate treatments focus on the current forest. Regeneration treatments focus on the next forest. And here is a picture of the garden in May. And uh, the efforts that you're doing to prepare the forest are very different than the efforts that you're doing to, um, for the next forest, very different than the, than the tending treatments or the intermediate treatments. Even age and uneven age systems differ, silvicultural so systems differ in when they use these intermediate and regeneration treatments. And those are, these are common words with foresters, but you, your forester talking to you may not use that term because it's very much a jargon term. Um, so if you're familiar and comfortable with it, then you can communicate at that level. But think about even age systems, which include clear cutting, seed tree, and shelter wood, and the variance of those. Uh, those an entry is uh, typically is an either or entry, and it's either done to manipulate the current forest, which would be a tending treatment or an intermediate treatment. Uh, and that's a contrast to a regeneration treatment, uh, which is done to regenerate the next force. And the regeneration is thought of as a process. I was talking with Jim Finley and uh, indirectly through Jim with Susan Stout um, from Pennsylvania. And Susan, uh, as, as Jim described it, you know, um, represents the regeneration treatments as a process. It's not a single point in time effort. The regeneration process may take many, many years. Uh, because you need to have that combination of controlling interfering vegetation, controlling deer, having the appropriate seed set, um, and that may take some time. In contrast, the uneven age system, which includes group selection and single tree selection, uh, here 
uh, every entry should include both intermediate treatments or tending treatments and regeneration treatments. So you're going into that young patch of woods that was created 15 years ago and you may be thinning in that young patch of woods which is a regeneration but in the adjacent area you may be doing some regeneration treatments or things that will regenerate the next forest. So the operations, the operators need to have that um, dual talent and, and dual responsibility. Um, it's important to point out here the word choice, uh, the technical phrasing of selection is for appropriate, sustainable, deliberate um, treatments. Uh, some people talk about selective, T-I-V, S-L-E-C-T-I-V, selective cutting. Uh, that's generally associated with um, unsustainable, they may be very deliberate, but it's unsustainable non-silvicultural manipulations where you select the best trees and leave the lower grade, lower value, um, unhealthy trees behind. So selection is good, selective is not good. Okay, the fifth step is to think about the appropriate tools for a given situation. Those tools uh, will help us get from current condition, which is A, to a desired condition, which is B. So we, we know what our current stand condition is, and we can describe it as either a young pine plantation, as a semi-mature hardwood stand, as an early successional, uh, what people would refer to as a brushy field. And we can say, where do, what do I want this stand to look like? And, and we know what we want that stand to look like based on our ownership objectives. And then there's this, uh, you see in the middle, this partial list of, laundry list of potential treatments or activities that you might do silviculturally to move the current stand into the desired stand condition. So you would, you, and this is an, an, um, a partial list, or you and your forester would would decide what in particular you might do. It might be one or two things from this list to help move your stand from point A to point B. So the tools fall into generally three categories. There are uh, chemical controls using herbicides. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There are biological controls. This is a picture of using goats to control understory vegetation. There are other types of livestock you can use. You would also include in here uh, biocontrol agents, insects, for example, the beetles that are being used to try to control um, hemlock woolly adelgid or the wasps that are, are being used in the monitoring of emerald ash borer. So biological control is any uh, typically anything from the animal kingdom um, although I guess you could include fungi in there if you were dispersing fungi uh, to try to control uh, some element of the forest. And then uh, what's perhaps most common are the mechanical controls. You can see as an example, uh, flame weeding using a flamethrower on buckthorn, which by the way doesn't work, um, or using a chainsaw, which is you know the most common uh, tried and true method. Um, but I'll also call your attention to, to what's wrong with this picture. Um, particularly notice there's no safety equipment other than a hard hat. He doesn't have chaps on. Um, and he doesn't have, for those of you that are familiar with safe chainsaw use, you'll notice that his thumb is not wrapped around that handlebar. So anyway, so these are some of the tools. They're just a few examples, and we'll, you'll see some pictures of more as we go along. Let's now look at um, uh, some owners of some ownership objectives and some silvicultural operations. I see Bob has a question for flame weeding beach in the winter. Actually, we did some flame weeding of beach. I think you'll see a picture of it here in just a few minutes. Um, uh, and I did not, what I didn't do is I didn't look at root sucker development on beach. Beach takes a long time to die. And so I we flamed the trees, we tagged them and followed them uh, in, actually in that same part of that Genesee County Park where you saw the group selection cuts and uh, flame weeded saplings. And it took in some cases four years for the beech trees to die. Um, and you know the, the bark would have all fallen off, the wood was cracked, you could see that there was no connection. 
the tree would still have almost a full leafy canopy, and it wasn't, and there would be fungal fruiting bodies coming from the area where I had flamed. So I knew that I had disconnected the crown from the roots, but the tree didn't realize that yet. And what really was the the final straw for the for the those beech trees was uh, we had a, a heavy winter storm of snow and ice, and the snow load snapped those trees off, and that was what finally killed them. So. Um, I, uh, flame weeding will eventually kill the above ground plant. Um, most of those plants also had some uh, sprout development from the stems. So it was not, it was a temporary fix. Okay, our first um, ownership objective that we might want to try to move towards is uh, to enhance road and trail access. And so how would silviculture be used to enhance road and trail access? And this is, uh, I offer this as the first one, partly because roads and trails are an essential part of private ownerships. And, and private ownerships, you know, of the size that we're talking about are owned at least in part for almost all of them that I know of, the people that I've interacted with. It's at least a very common interest of uh, getting into the woods, and even myself included, although I'm very comfortable walking in the woods without a trail in my woodlots, I spend most of my time walking on trails. And so if we need trails, uh, um, logging activity that that accomplishes some other silvicultural goal may be, the, may be the answer. So you can see here a skitter that's pulling out a, a hitch of ash logs and you'll recognize the butt end of these logs are saw logs and then the upper end are firewood pieces of firewood. So this is an integrated harvest extracting uh, tree length uh, firewood and saw log products. And when you have big machines like this, they leave um, well-defined roads. And so silviculturally and from an ownership perspective, by talking with your forester in particular and also talking with the logger in particular, letting them know what you have as a recreational interest in locating those trails, it may be that you can um, adjust where those trails might go um, over where they had initially been planned because um, you have some um, additional ownership objective for access to a particular area. It's also important to note that uh, when you're moving logs particularly, and this isn't a particularly big hitch of logs, but with big hitches of logs and at certain times of the year there will be damage to trees along the trees along the skid trail. Uh, that can be limited to some extent, but particularly where you have bumper trees or the skid trail goes around a corner, uh, positioning that and, and bumpering, picking these bumper trees, uh, trees that are not um, of high value or not desired as future crop trees is important. So this may be more, um, more presence than what some people want in their woods, although this is if you want a fast way to create a trail where you don't have to do the work, uh, but you do have to do a lot of good communicating, this is an option. Another option are, are you know, the, the homeowner approach, and it's using uh, ATVs and either commercial arches or homemade arches or four-wheel drive tractors with uh, farmy winches or things that are like farmy winches. Uh, these are ways, these, are, these tools will not as easily create the trails, but will do a pretty good job of maintaining them. Uh, there are similar caveats. You can damage high quality trees using any of these pieces of equipment. The damage to the residual trees is typically not a function of the size of the equipment. It's more a function of the attitude of the person that's driving the machine and whether or not they want to be uh, conscientious. Another objective is uh, maybe for um, improving tree growth. Uh, here we see some pictures. We see uh, this was part of a sugar bush thinning study that we did. In the left hand picture, we see uh, the sugar bush or what was going to become the sugar bush prior to thinning, and we see a sugar bush post thinning. I don't know that these are 
two identical spots. They're, they are the same ownership, but maybe not two, the identical pictures. So what thinning does is that it reallocates um, competition. It reduces competition uh, for sunlight amongst the trees. The trees that you leave behind are the trees that have the potential benefit from that increase in sunlight. Uh, it's important to know that and your forester should know this, that uh, not all trees are going to respond the same way to thinning. This is a chart from Dr. Nyland's silviculture textbook looking at crown class response. Uh, well, this is just defining crown class. And what the point that he makes is that the upper crown class trees, here are the dominant trees that are getting sunlight from the top and from the sides, and the co-dominant trees that are getting sunlight on the top as well as essentially across the, the broadness of the top, they have a much uh, uh, better capacity to respond to thinning than if you were to release some of these lower crown class intermediate or suppressed trees that get much less sunlight. These lower crown class trees have one third to one eighth as much capacity to respond as the upper crown class trees. So thinning will reallocate the growth, but to get the maximum response of that growth, um, you need to be uh, focusing that sunlight on the upper crown class trees. One way to do this, and this is a fairly easy strategy for landowners to apply, and they can do it on just a couple of trees and see how it feels, or they can do it on uh, 3 acres or 13 acres or 30 acres is a concept known as crop tree release. Um, and I've truncated a, a fairly long concept into one or two slides. I would encourage you to do an internet search for crop tree management and you will find plenty of reading material. But basically what happens is the, uh, the woodlot is inventoried so that you know the mixture of species and you know the quality of species. And then you identify the best trees and you release those best trees uh, from competition by doing a crown touching release. You'll get the best response, obviously focusing again on the dominant and co-dominant trees, releasing them on four sides. Um, there are some uh, drawbacks to doing a four-sided release. One is that depending upon the species, you may develop um, a very nice uh, crop of epicormic branches, these branches that come out the side of a tree when it has a sudden release and exposure to sunlight. Some trees are more prone to doing that than others. Uh, and uh, trees that are in lower crown class or lower vigor classes are more likely to develop epicormic sprouts than upper crown class and fully healthy trees. Another concern with too much opening of the stand too quickly is that trees will, uh, trees will experience a higher level of wind turbulence. And if the trees don't have a good mechanical stability, particularly looking at the bud of the trees, if you don't have a good flare or bell uh, where the trees enter the ground, it may lack mechanical stability. And those trees, particularly on thin soils uh, over bedrock or thin soils over perched water tables, those trees may be more likely to uh, fall over in the wind. So you've just made an investment of sunlight in a tree, and it falls over during the next um, during the next windstorm. Uh, similarly, you will, you'll add a lot of sunlight to this tree. You'll also add a lot of sunlight to the ground layer, and you can uh, have a very quick response of raspberries as well as invasive species, uh, buckthorn, multiflora, rose, autumn olive will all uh, respond well to that sunlight. Another ownership objective might be to improve saw log quality. Here's a picture of uh, somebody. These are pictures I, I, I was able to find on the uh, University of Georgia based um, forestry images dot, I think, com, but it may be dot org. Uh, but it shows a picture of somebody using a pruning saw to prune a pine tree. Uh, noting that it's most uh, economically justified to do pruning on relatively small trees and obviously not, maybe not obviously, but not on all trees per acre. You pick your best trees and, and you make your investment. This, is, this takes a fair amount of work. Uh, we have our, our daughters prune our pine trees. I pay them 50 cents a tree. 
uh, and they have to prune at least a 12-foot log, and they have to pick trees that are in the upper crown class, have branches that are less than an inch in diameter, uh, and trees that have been released from a thinning. So um, they, they flag the trees that they prune, and then uh, I go out and inspect them, and if they haven't met the criteria, then they don't get paid. So I think I've got a pretty good deal, but they're also there. You know, the trees belong to my daughter, so I'm not going to benefit from that directly. So they, they've got some skin in the game. When you're pruning a tree, uh, you don't prune it. And this is illustrated in the right-hand picture. Uh, you would prune it where the, ideally where you would have this kind of pinkish red line. Um, you don't, uh, you want to essentially minimize, not fully minimize the, the wound because, you know, this would be the smallest diameter wound. Uh, but what you don't want to do is what's called a flush cut. So, for example, flush along the stem from where that cursor is down here. You can see that, that the, the opening would be maybe twice the diameter as the opening that's associated with the cut on that red line. So it creates a much larger opening. The other thing it does is it eliminates the callus tissue and the limb collar tissue that allows for healing and growing over that wound. Uh, and this is why you would typically only prune smaller diameter branches because there's not much value in prune from a from an increasing saw log value, there's not much value in pruning a two inch or a three inch diameter branch because by the time you heal over that wound and the tree, the diameter of growth that tree would need to make in order to fully cover that up with clear wood, um, you know, the tree would be massive in size and it's, and it's uh, too long of a return interval, return on investment interval. Uh, okay, I see some questions. Um, so Bob makes a good point. There are some understory trees, depending upon species and age, that may respond uh, well to a, an overstory release. Really. Some of the shade tolerant species can recover from growing under su suppression. Um, uh, the first one that comes to mind is something like sugar maple that's tolerant of shade. Uh, and if you have, depending upon the growth form of those trees, if they still have a strong central leader, a strong uh, vertical tendency, then those trees might be able to respond. Uh, they would still, their, their response is going to be less than the growth response of an upper canopy tree and the, and the time duration for them to, re, to provide a return on that thinning investment is going to be much longer because you're, you know, I mean, just the sizes of the trees, you're going from a, maybe releasing a 10 or 12 inch tree versus a one inch diameter tree. With sugar maple and probably with some of the other shade tolerant species, they'll get trees, they'll get to a point, they'll still be alive, but the top will essentially flatten out. They will have lost that central leader tendency. Uh, those trees typically um, are not going to be a good investment for release. Okay, and Benjamin's making the point about uh, uh, pruning, so thank you. Okay, another objective is going to be, our, and we're 8 o'clock and I'm not far enough along. I'm talking too much. Sorry. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll accelerate this, and if you can hang on, we'll hopefully get through it. Ownership, another ownership objective is reducing health issues uh, through thinning operations. You look at trees like this. This is from a, a, a picture from a presentation that I do on sugar bush management. Uh, so all these trees are sugar maple trees, uh, and all of these trees have um, a great likelihood that at some point they're going to snap. So if, you're, if your intent is to try to reduce the incidence of these diseases, uh, reduce the likelihood of damage uh, during windstorms, these would be trees that you would target during the thinning operation. Um, another ownership objective may be to limit the abundance of undesirable or interfering vegetation. This is, I think, the same beach picture I showed earlier. Um, I've done a lot of work with beach, so I have a, a lot of pictures of beach problems in the woods. Uh, beach includes, uh, or interfering vegetation includes beach and uh, hop hornbeam and, uh, or eastern, yeah, hop hornbeam, um, uh, in some cases, black birch, ferns, striped maple, many of the invasive shrubs such as barberry and buckthorn and autumn olive and multiflora rose. Um, 
these are all species that have, you know, may have some redeeming qualities, but they all share the common characteristics that they can create a monoculture in the understory and exclude other species, either either through shade or other mechanisms, and therefore limit the diversity of the forest, limit access, you know, the physical access of people getting in and out of the woods. I don't know how many of you have had the option or the opportunity to walk through a multiflora rose thicket, but, you know, for me that is a, that's a, a game stopper on access, and, and, and it limits the diversity of the species, tree species as well as wildlife species. So too much of a good thing uh, controlling that may be an ownership objective. And there are silvicultural strategies that you can use to do that. Those strategies would be would be grouped as either broadcast treatments you see in the left picture. This was a, a, a ground-based foliar herbicide treatment to control American beech, hop hornbeam, black birch, and uh, striped maple. And it's broadcast in the sense that it was sprayed. Everything in the understory where the spraying was treated was killed. So if there are desirable stems, uh, those are killed as well as undesirable wherever they can, the stems are low enough to have foliage intercepting the, the herbicide. Uh, we retained the overstory trees, as you can see, so we have a seed source, controlled the understory, and we have other mechanisms where we're controlling deer, so we're uh, expecting to regenerate this forest. There may be other situations where a selective herbicide treatment is more desirable, and that is illustrated in the lower right-hand um, picture where a uh, Garlon 4, which is a triclopyr-based herbicide, is applied in, as a basal bark treatment to beech trees, uh, picking individual stems. You can, you can imagine that the, the number of stems per acre being treated efficiently with a selective treatment that uh, versus a broadcast treatment, the tipping point is about four to 500 stems per acre. So if you have you know, fewer than four or 500 stems per acre, you may want to use a selective treatment. Uh, if you have more than that, you may want to use a broadcast treatment. There are, there are certainly other considerations uh, that I can't go into right now, but um, just you know, think about those and talk to, talk to knowledgeable people before you jump into either of these two strategies. There are some uh, organic methods that you can use. Uh, in all of these, the, the basal bark treatment is a chemical girdle. There are mechanical girdles. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, a chainsaw girdle. Here's flame weeding of buckthorn in the wintertime at the base. Uh, flame weeding of beech. This is, as I recall, was in the spring. We did that treatment. Uh, so these are always girdling our, our, our mechanisms to disassociate or disconnect the foliage from the roots. Uh, and that's all they do. Um, I don't want to say that's all they do. They're, they're effective in doing that. Um, but that, the, that's the mechanism by which girdling works. Um, here's some more pictures of selective treatments, controlling beach sprain, a glyphosate concentrate on the outer two inches of the freshly cut surface. The glyphosate is mobile within the plant and moves out and kills uh, the interconnected root systems. You may have an ownership objective to enhance wildlife habitat. Uh, some examples of that are illustrated here. In the upper left-hand corner, one of the things we do on the, on the Cornell harvest now is that we require all of the butt ends of the logging job to be left on the landing, and they're piled in a way such that it creates habitat that is conducive to a greater variety of reptiles in particular, but also amphibians that will use these They'll overwinter in these habitats and they use them for foraging areas. It may be that as part of a harvest you want to require uh, that tops be left behind, um, that tops create slash. It, it's, it's a visually very different forest than when the tops are removed. The owner needs to be conscious of that, but it creates certain kinds of conditions that may favor, <coughs> excuse me, favor some wildlife uh, while also excluding others, excluding, for example, uh, at least for a time period, deer that are not as likely to move into those tree crowns and uh, um, 
uh, browse on seedlings that may be established. While you have your skitter operator in place or the bulldozer has come back to smooth over the uh, skid trails, uh, have pre-planned some locations. Uh, they can put in a, a shallow berm. Uh, you know, a pond like this takes a talented bulldozer operator um, just a few minutes to push the dirt around, and you have a shallow uh, pool, perhaps a ephemeral pool that's great for a number of aquatic organisms. And protecting water quality. There's there's a lot of information that's available through state forestry agencies and soil and water conservation districts on on practices that are done to control the movement of water. Uh, the, the, the basic strategy is that you want to manage small amounts of slow moving water and get the water off the road. So these are some examples of an open top culvert on the left hand picture and then a, a water bar in the right hand picture. Uh, there are many other water control structures. And then finally, aesthetics and leisure. So uh, it may be that you have an ownership objective for aesthetics and leisure. This is a picture of a of a pine log bench that I have on my property uh, because I always tell myself I'm going to have free time and I'm going to go out and sit there and just we have a lot of, of um, thrushes and I like to listen to the thrushes. So I go out and I sit on this or I think I'm going to go out and I sit on this. I usually end up getting too busy with other projects. But this is an area, so I've kind of set it aside. I've created, I've done some very limited cutting in this area so I can maintain a, a tall forest canopy. And um, I have my bench for when I have the time to get out there. OK, let's spend a little time talking about regeneration. A lot of those pictures were dealing with uh, intermediate treatments. Let's think about regeneration. Regeneration absolutely depends upon sunlight and also controlling deer and controlling seed sources. So if you have too many deer and if you don't have a seed source, you're not going to regenerate um, a forest. And what I'll do is I'll go through a series of these regeneration um, systems, silvicultural systems. Uh, and, and we'll start with the least disturbance and move towards the most disturbance. So the least disturbance is a single tree selection. And what you can see is a cut where a single tree was removed a few years ago. This is in a sugar maple stand in Ontario, Canada. It has regenerated uh, a, a patch, a small single tree patch of sugar maple seedlings. Uh, some years prior, there was a patch that was cut over here. That's now maybe a two inch diameter cluster of regeneration. Uh, sometime prior to that, there was another patch here. This is now uh, some four to six inch diameter trees. And then another age class here represented by this 12 inch diameter sugar maple. So there's this progression of age classes and clusters. And every time you would go in and create an opening to regenerate to establish seedlings, you might also do some thinning in these um, more older age classes so that you're selecting for stem characteristics or species composition to match your ownership objectives. It's worth noting here with single tree selection, this is conducive only for shade tolerant species. And in, in many parts of the country, this would also have to be uh, shade tolerant species that are not uh, preferentially browsed by deer. So that the bad, that's the good news. The bad news is that in a lot of eastern forests, the only species that meets that criteria is American beech, which if you're trying to manage for beech, then you have um, a lot of opportunity. Moving up the disturbance continuum, we'd go to a group selection. Um, and a group selection is, is essentially a patch that's cut. And it may be, this is about a tenth to a quarter of an acre patch. Uh, and within a stand, you would have multiple patches that are cut. And that's one of the differentiations of this uneven age versus a patch clear cut that we'll talk about later. So a patch would be uh, multiple patches within a stand. Uh, and, and every time you would go in and you would have a, a predetermined cutting cycle based on the growth rates, which would be determined in part by the soils, every time you go in and cut every 10 to 15 years, you would create some of these new openings, but you would also go back and do some tending or intermediate treatments in previous openings to control the growth, the quality, and the composition. 
A two-age stand is kind of a hybrid between even-aged and uneven-aged systems, uh, and it's just as it looks. It's a two-age class. This is a, um, a nice picture of a failed two-age silvicultural um, effort that was done at the Arnott Forest oh, 25 or 30 years ago. The intent was that there would be these oak trees that were left behind, and they would regenerate a... There was, they were fairly sparse. Uh, they would uh, regenerate um, more oak seedlings. Well, the problem was that juvenile oak trees don't cast acorns. And so without casting acorns, you do not gener regenerate oak forests. But what you regenerate is black birch and striped maple and hop hornbeam. So it's technically a two-aged forest, but it's not a two-aged forest that's meeting the objectives of ownership. So I use this to it's a nice illustration of two of two different age classes, but um, be alert to the fact that just because you do something, you need to do it. It needs to happen correctly, and you need to plan for those for those strategies. Okay, moving squarely into the even aged regeneration systems, the least disturbing is a shelterwood system. A shelterwood uh, in 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 again with all of these, the, the intent is we're trying to regenerate the forest and uh, and we're creating a certain age structure. Previously, we had multiple age classes. With these even age systems, we're going to create a forest that has essentially a single age class. A shelterwood system has a sheltering effect on the regeneration. So there are uh, many trees left behind. You leave the best trees behind in an effort. It's like essentially selective breeding. You're leaving behind the best trees to produce seed that will produce trees that will be, in uh, in theory, the best quality trees. As that when that next forest becomes established, you would eventually go in and remove uh, remove the overstory because the understory, such as these white pine, would would need uh, higher sunlight conditions in order to develop fully. In shelterwood. Just so you know, technically maybe either a two entry or a three entry shelter would. Moving along the uh, increasing the disturbance continuum, we see a seed tree harvest where we have uh, fewer trees left behind. So here the, the need is less on the sheltering effects and more on a higher sunlight condition while also retaining trees that would be used as a seed source. And again, when the next forest is established with the uh, necessary levels of desired stocking for number of seedlings of appropriate species, then the overstory would be removed. Uh, you would be monitoring this understory to make sure that, that it's not invaded by uh, undesirable plants, whether they're native or non-native, uh, and, and create conditions that would even though you have high sunlight conditions uh, coming through the main, through the upper canopy, uh, interfering vegetation, whether it's ferns or grasses or beech or invasive non-native shrubs, uh, could preclude the development of a desired understory. Okay, and then at the upper end of the disturbance continuum, we have clear cuts, and clear cuts can come in all different shapes and sizes. This is a strip clear cut that was put in, and a clear cut by definition is an even aged regeneration technique. So when people clear a house lot, that's technically not a clear cut, that's, um, that's land clearing. So a clear cut is a regeneration technique, and it assumes because you have removed all of the overstory trees, it assumes that you are going to, uh, you have another way, another mechanism to regenerate that forest. Either you have uh, fully established seedlings, and you're just releasing those established seedlings, or you're going to be using seeds that are produced adjacent to the clear cut, or you're going to be using uh, root suckers. Um, that are regenerated. So in the, the aspen stands in the, in the upper Midwest that are regenerated aspen and aspen along with beech and black locust and black gum and sassafras, uh, all the poplars, not, not eastern cottonwood, but uh, quaking aspen and big tooth aspen, all regenerate vegetatively from the root system. 
So silviculturally, you go in, you cut the overstory, you've created a perfect scenario situation for those roots to reproduce. So that's a strip clear cut. These are, are um, not strip clear cuts. Uh, this is a picture we looked at earlier. This was a uh, very poor soil uh, on the Arnott Forest, uh, poorly drained, low fertility. This took 12 or 15 years before this regenerated. It eventually regenerated to birch and aspen and a little bit of oak uh, and some pine. And then the, the picture on the lower right is a, so the picture in the upper left was maybe part of a 20 acre clear cut. The picture in the lower right is a two acre clear cut um, that was, that I put in on our property in the eastern Adirondacks. And it's, I'm using it to illustrate this as a clear cut, which you don't see in this picture. There are probably, in the, and this was a two acre stand, so technically this is a clear cut. Um, if this was a two acre harvest unit that was part of a 20 acre stand, it would be a group selection. So that's how that um, that's how that plays out. Now what you don't see in this picture is I left behind uh, 10 or 15 uh, really nice quality red pine and white pine. Even though I had, you can see the kind of the green tinge on the ground, I had a nicely established pine seedling layer. I left those trees behind as kind of a safety net in case I had a seedling failure for whatever reason and also um, uh, just aesthetically, I, I like to have those scattered big trees left behind. Uh, one thing that I didn't expect when I did my pre-harvest inventory in here, there was essentially nothing in the understory. Um, the, the pine seedlings became established, so this was a year or two before I did the cut. The pine seedlings became established in the year preceding the cut and have done well since. What I didn't anticipate was the um, the invasion of undesirable uh, non-native shrubs. And I think I have found, other than Barbera, I have found every um, woody non-native shrub that can be a problem in New York has shown up uh, in this woods. Well, I didn't have um, glossy leafed buckthorn, but I had European buckthorn, autumn olive, multiflora rose, bush honeysuckle, uh, Japanese bittersweet, um, and one other that I can't think of. So, you create a sunlight condition that's good for the desired plants. It's also good for um, uh, it's also good for uh, the undesirable plants. So, Bob, I'm going to come back to those questions. Just have a few more slides I want to get through. All right, what you don't want to do is get trapped in this thinking of silver culture. And there was I saw an ad in a newspaper. It was a little you know, one of those weekly newspapers and there was somebody that was advertising their services, you know, call me up, I know how to practice silver culture, uh, which um, I think that they were confused and it was a comical, I guess kind of comical confusion. Um, uh, they were thinking, they were talking about silver culture and so it was, I don't know if that's a Freudian slip or not, but what they were really talking about was exploitive logging. And exploiting logging um, is driven by economic only decisions. So if we think about this as your typical hardwood forest in New York, uh, you know, and it may have an age of 80 years, let's say, and you go in and your decisions to cut are not necessarily based on, on, a, on you know, some broad thinking, but are just economically driven, which trees are you going to cut? Which trees are you going to pick? Well, it's probably these three, three trees. You're going to pick the red oak and the white ash and the black cherry. And then what you have left behind will be some low quality American beech and red maple. So you've gone from a more diverse forest to a less diverse forest. You've gone from a more productive growing potential to a less productive growing potential. Now, I'm not saying you should never cut these trees. I mean, I like I like wood products. And uh, at some point, it would be appropriate to cut those trees. But what you would there's a process that you would need to go through in your forest or using silvicultural principles would help to regenerate this forest to these desirable species prior to eliminating them from the stand. 
excuse me, what we're talking about with silviculture is also um, known as high grading or diameter limit cutting. High grading is you cut the highest grade or the highest value trees and you ignore or leave behind the low value trees. Diameter limit cutting is where you set a diameter threshold and you say we're going to cut all the trees bigger than 16 inches or bigger than 20 inches or bigger than 12 inches, whatever that diameter limit is. Uh, and some people try to justify the unsustainability of diameter limit cutting by saying, oh, well, I only cut down to 20 inches. It's still a diameter limit cut. The, 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 uh, and depending upon the structure of the stand, you may have had um, the same or not the same impact as if you did a 16-inch diameter limit cut. So high grading doesn't stop the world from spinning. Um, it, it, you know, it typically does not have a negative effect on soil productivity, and you're leaving behind a green forest. It happens, you know, it falls in the category of what is a green lie, because the forest is um, the forest is a different mixture of species. It has a, a lesser ability to serve the productive needs of the forest. Now, that may be for some owners in some time frames okay, uh, but as a whole, when we start start accumulating a lot of those types of forests, uh, the, the consequences will be farther reaching. Uh, there are many other, and you can see the many other negative consequences, uh, ecosystem level and forest level consequences to high grading. They range from um, conservation types of concerns with diversity and food sources to economic uh, concerns to uh, productivity types of concerns. And then finally, and we're almost done here, a couple more slides, we have to uh, monitor the response uh, that we get when we, when we do something. Um, we, we predict what's going to happen, but then when we need to monitor it and make sure that there are no surprises, just like uh, I put in my two acre clear cut and I was surprised that I had, um, I figured I would get a couple of invasives, but um, every year I spend, you know, an afternoon in that two acre patch dealing with some of those invasive shrubs. So um, it's, it's, it's more than I, more than I expected, more than I wanted, but still at a man, I've caught it at a manageable level. So your responsibilities as an owner, you have to be able to know what your objectives are. That's your starting point. If nothing else, I hope that this talk about silviculture has brought you to recognize the need for um, identifying and articulating uh, your ownership objectives, those that you have and with the co-owners of your property working with your forester to develop and follow a management plan. Educate yourself. This is a one-hour introductory overview to silviculture. There's much more that goes into silviculture. Uh, you as uh, you know, woodland owners don't need to be silviculturalists. You need to be uh, conversant in that. And there's a lot of other things you need to be knowledge about, being able to identify invasive plants, um, being able to identify the, the wildlife that you enjoy seeing on your property, understanding the habitat needs of wildlife, understanding the, the, um, some of the conditions where certain types of forest might grow. Those are, are good things to learn with. You need to work uh, and select competent foresters and loggers, and foresters are different than loggers. They're both vitally important, but they serve two very different functions. The link that I put earlier in the chat pod for the stewardship bulletin, there's another, there's two articles in there as well as the gardening article. There's one on working with foresters and one on uh, working with loggers. So finally, your next steps, you know, we come back, we always hit back on those objectives and the management plan. Uh, the rest of this really revolves around uh, networking with other people. So get involved with groups such as in New York, uh, Woodland Owners um, coalesce under the New York Forest Owners Association. They have woods walks, and you'll see um, opportunity. You'll have opportunities to walk in uh, woodlots of other private woodland owners. You'll see things that they did that you like, and you'll see things that they did that you didn't like, and both of those are instructive. Um, you also need to participate in educational events. I mentioned the Ning site earlier. Let me see if I can type that in really quick. Yep, 
and uh, there's a there's a events calendar there. So you know, if you become a member, you can post if you're hosting educational events or wherever you are. If you're not in New York, then then find something in your local area <coughs> and educate yourself. Go on these woods walks, talk with other landowners. Uh, when you're forester and you're logger in the woods, if there's any way that you can be in the woods with them, take the time to be in the woods with them. So with that, I will, uh, let me reconfigure the screen a little bit. I'm going to put up the exit survey. You all have been very patient with my long-winded presentation. That usually happens in the evening. I tend to talk longer in the evening than I do uh, at noon. Uh, so in the top pod, you see a link to the exit uh, survey. I'd appreciate you taking that. That's quite beneficial to me. And let me scroll back and make sure I've hit on all these questions. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, Bob's pointing out about pruning and fire-prone areas um, that reduces the fuel loading uh, near the ground and may minimize uh, the chances of a, of a fire spreading from the ground level up into the crown. Benjamin's looking at... Uh, High deer population area, uh, and the top, you know, the treetops impede the movement of deer. Uh, treetops, depending upon, excuse me, treetops, depending upon how many you have clustered together, and the abundance of deer can have an inhibitory effect. Um, uh, and there are some colleagues of mine who are doing some research on those tops and whether you can you can put enough tops on the ground so that you have a fully stocked stand is one question and whether you you know whether the tops will be um, functional long enough to get those trees established um, you need to have uh, you need to have some assurances and, and some synchronization of the presence of the tops with the good seed year uh, this is, for example, this is in this part of the state, this is the first year in maybe six or eight years when we've had a good sugar maple seed crop. So if uh, five years ago you had a harvest and you created those tops, those tops would largely be non-functional as deer barrier uh, at, at this point in time in the sugar maple seeds that might become established in those residual residue kinds of piles would not receive any uh, significant protection. So I'm not, I'm not downplaying the role of tops, uh, treetops as a deer barrier, but just highlighting the need for um, synchronizing the timing of top creation with seed rain. Okay, Bob is uh, talking about black birch. Let's see. Valuable tree in the future. Uh, and I've heard that in other circles. There's a, I've heard that you know in some places black birch uh, is quite valuable. In fact, we've had uh, some of the birch that we've harvested. And we don't typically, and maybe we will start doing more of this. We don't typically think of birch as a saw log species, but we had a logger that had a market from central New York to move his black birch as veneer to some place up in Maine. Um, so you can imagine that you know if, if we were valuing it at a firewood stumpage price, and he was selling it for veneer, um, he made out better on that deal than we did. So in, in all species, however it's done, will um, will benefit from having the, the Bob's talking about uh, using stems to train the black birch, um, having an adequate stocking of stems will train those trees. Um, and that goes back to, at some level to, to the deer and the treetops. If you just have these isolated patches of, of regeneration in treetops, there may not be an overall stocking that's sufficient at the acre level in order to train those trees and develop uh, quality stems. Uh, Bob says, how much scarification did they get during the harvest? Actually, the picture that I showed of that two-acre clear cut, there was no scarification. Um, I still haven't. That, I did that in the summer of, when did I finish that? 2010, maybe? Oh my gosh, maybe that was 2009. Um, so some of those log, and I'm going to move them. I have an ATV and an arch. Uh, I'm going to move those uh, one log at a time. <laughs> 
into um, and put them on my bandsaw. So some of them have already started to decay and will no longer be available, but currently there's been no machinery in there. So there is no uh, scarification. The, the pine that has established is established through uh, the pine litter layer. Uh, silviculture is, uh, for William's question, silviculture is very practical and maybe um, all the more essential in managing riparian forest buffers. Again, it's you know, here you have a, a specific ownership objective that's in addition to other types of ownership objectives, and that relates to uh, maintaining water quality. So your forester would, would have some guidance about, uh, particularly about uh, limiting soil disturbance, um, maybe limiting the scale of disturbance depending upon the, the size of the stream and what what role that stream has. Um, if you if you open up, uh, provide too much sunlight on the edge of the stream, you may end up with um, some of those uh, waters being warmed up. Uh, the, they won't necessarily warm the waters immediately on your property, but the cumulative effect downstream uh, may be for warmer waters which have a lower oxygen holding capacity. So, all right, so Bob, I did, just for clarification, I did get, I've got great pine regeneration. Um, I was very concerned, this was one of the things I thought about and looked at and talked to some folks. Uh, the two acre cut that I have, I've got phenomenal pine regeneration. I just also got some other regeneration of other species that I wasn't expecting. So uh, and it, and it, I think it links in with the timing of the seed set. So we, we in 2009 was a good pine year, pine, white pine seed crop year in that part of the state. Um, I did another one acre clear cut in 2008 in an area and that was a year that we didn't have a good pine seed set and I've not got as and, and that I did go in with a, a farm tractor and did some scarification I did not get the, the seed uh, regenerate the pine regeneration there that I was hoping for so um, I'm looking at it more from a seed availability perspective thank you Ben I will Graham asked about Ralph Nyland's textbook, Single Source. Um, Ralph's, so I guess it depends on what you want to learn about. Um, Ralph Nyland has a um, forestry student uh, text, it's an academic textbook. So it, it's, uh, it, it gives the principles very well. There are some other, um, other textbooks written by one is by Smith as an author, and then uh, Mark Ashton, I think, at, or is he at Yale, is an author on a separate. So there's maybe three different silvicultural textbooks. McDaniels may have one as well. I'm most familiar with Ralph Nyland's textbook, um, but I use it as a reference book as opposed to as a uh, as, as a learning book. So there are and there are some other good books that that are m more so oriented towards non-technical audience. Tom uh, McAvoy in Vermont has, a, I think, a really good book called Low Impact Forestry. It's not strictly on silviculture, but it talks about using forestry in a way that accomplishes ownership objectives without um, with a, a minimizing negative impacts. Right, you know, William Razor, go to Amazon and, and type in silviculture and see what but I would, Nyland's book is good. Um, um, you know, another, depending upon what you want, um, NRAISE, let me see if I can, I think NRAISE is www.nrise. NRAISE is the Natural Resources Ag Engineering, what does S stand for? Natural Resources Ag Engineering something. Um, it's a cooper it's a um, uh, it's a clustering of cooperative extension in the Northeast. It's a publishing clearinghouse, and so there are publications on NRAISE. There's one 
that was called Forest Ecology and Silviculture. It's a little paperback book, and it might be 50 pages long, and it gives some good, um, good an overview of the principles of forest ecology and silviculture. That may be what's used in some of the logger training courses. So it depends on, you know, I would check out, you know, Ralph Nyland's book is 100 bucks or more. Um, you know, the book from NRAIS is probably, I'll guess, is 10 bucks. So um, I would, in Tom McAvoy's book, might be in the 20 to $25 range. I'm, I'm guessing on those numbers. But I know that Ralph's book is fairly expensive and these other ones are less so. So you might start with these less expensive books, um, see if they provide what you need, and then move to a more academic treatment um, if you think that that suits your interests. So, well, you have all been, uh, particularly those of you that have stuck this out, have been very uh, generous with your time. I appreciate that. I, I apologize for running over. This is a, a fun topic, and uh, you had some very good questions. I appreciate those. Um, I will be uh, posting, I'll send the link out, I'll post the I'll post the websites for the recorded versions of this. I can do that promptly on my Ning site, and then I will uh, very soon be able to have those posted on my Forest Connect, my main website in the webinar location. So I'm, I haven't finalized a speaker yet for next month for November. I'm hoping to get uh, Dr. Tom Seeley to talk about uh, woodlands and honeybees. And it's a, a fascinating topic looking at the role, um, the, the greater survivability and vigor of honeybees in natural woodlands and um, the ways that bees interact with the forest. So it's not a management kind of presentation. It's more of an ecological kind of presentation. He's agreed to give the presentation. I just don't know if it'll be November or next year. In December, we have uh, Brian Burhans, who is um, the President and CEO of the American Chestnut Foundation. He's going to be talking about some of the neat things that are going on with American Chestnut. So thank you all and have a great evening.